Reformed Church. You know, today I just wanted to share with you a bit about, um, kind of even along the same lines that we were just praying about how, um, you know, we have not turned our hearts from the Lord, right? I mean, we're here um, and we have been listening to the gospel for a number of years now together. And we do that because our desire obviously is not to turn our heart away, but we have turned our hearts toward the Lord. And not only have we turned our hearts to the Lord, but we've turned our hearts to the Lord and asked him to continue to reform and change and transform our mind, right? To renew, I should say, renew our mind, right? Renew our mind to the gospel, to the truth, right? So so not only have you listened and tasted, right? But you've continued in that because you want the Lord to renew your mind. Um, but there, so, so that is, you know, as far as uh, from God's definition, that is the definition of God on, of continuing to do good, right? Continuing to do good is not about you, your actions per se, like whether you think you do good things or not, whether you help people or don't help people, whether you love or don't love. It, it's really about uh, doing good as far as God's definition of that is is continuing right continuing to do good not growing weary in well-doing that that is continuing in it, continuing to hear right so when he, the well-doing that god encourages the earth in not us right alone but the earth god encourages the earth in is is to listen to him to hear right um and god has set up the church like we were just saying before like god has set up the church um uh, on a pedestal upon the earth to say Hey, look, look at what they're saying and listen to what they're saying, right? The Lord wants, like if you, if you think about that from an earth perspective, a humanity perspective, right? The Lord wants the church uh, not, not just to, not, not to have uh, a podium, but to take the podium that God has given, right? It's God that lifts up, right? It is God that lifts up. Men, men in churches don't lift themselves up. It's God that has lifted up the church, right? So, so he wants us to take right, the position that he's given in order to herald and to speak. But uh, by the same token, there is what God calls wickedness or evil, right? And wickedness or evil is hearing what God is saying, right, and turning your face from it, right? Th- that's wickedness. Like, if you think, if you think why is that such, because wicked is a strong word, right? But wh- why is that such a wicked thing to do? Right, because if if you if you think about the gospel that we preach, right, it is Christ that suffered, right? It is Christ that became a curse for us. He there, there was no one around, right, to help, but he did it by himself, right? Took the judgment of the world that he's speaking to. He took the judgment of that world upon himself, and and then now he he heralds that, right? And he has been from the beginning of time speaking to people about what is good and what is wicked. And he said, you know, there's, I have been speaking this gospel to you from, right? We, we, you see it all over the Old Testament. And of course, you see it in the New, right? The, 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 the gospel that is preached to us being preached to, to all of humanity has been preached. The Lord desiring for the gospel to go around the world, right? And he desires that people would hear and not turn their face. So when people hear the right that they've been given, the right to partake of everything that is godly, the right to prosper, right? The right to be able to partake of the grace that God has so freely, so freely given. And if someone were to turn their face away from that and despise it, right? That someone would despise the bread of heaven, right? The way the people of Israel, it says they despised this worthless bread, they called it, right? When they despised that manna, what they didn't know is they were despising Christ who is the bread of life, right? That, that manna was a symbol of Christ that was to come. And it says that we despise we, this worthless bread. Let us go back to when we were in Egypt. So what, in other words, what they're saying is let us let, leave, leave us in bondage, right? And we have turned our face and turned our ears away from the bread of life, from the gospel, from Jesus Christ, right? In, um, if I can bring you quickly to Isaiah 63 and verse number 1. Isaiah 63 and verse number 1. This is New King James. It says, who is, this, uh, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then the answer is, I, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And then another question, who, why is your apparel red? 
and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And the answer is, I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the, the peoples, it says, no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, and there was no one to help, and I wondered, um, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm bought salvation for me. And my own fury has sustained me. Uh, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. So Isaiah that we're reading, obviously, is a prophet, right? Isaiah, like many prophets, like Micah, like Jeremiah, right? Um, like Ezekiel, were prophesying about the, go the, the gospel that was being spoken to them. In other words, speaking the good news to them but telling them, right, the, the, the price for turning your face away from a salvation that was freely given to you. Um, in other words, let me, let me explain this to you this way. In verse number one, when you look at it, he said, who is he who comes from Edom? Right now, let's just slow down there for a second, Edom. So wh why would the Lord ask that question, right? Because it's a question with an answer and then a question with an answer. So he asked, who, who, is, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? So Edom, Edom if, you, if you look at like its origin or the Edomites, if you've read that in the Bible, right? Edom came from Esau, right? Esau actually is said to be Edom, right? He said, it, actually the Bible literally says Esau is Edom, right? Esau, if you know, was uh, Rebekah's son. He had a brother, I believe it was a twin brother, right, named Jacob, right? Jacob and Esau, right, um, there was a huge difference between these two men. One is that one despised the gospel and the other one, right, desired the gospel. In other words, one despised his birthright. He was the firstborn and, and he, Esau, for just, just to be able to get a bowl of soup, right, because he desired to eat. Right? Even, though, even though, you know, in his mindset, he said, Esau said, in my mindset, it's just about living, eating, and dying. Right? So that's a very carnal mentality. Right? People think about that today. You know, you got to have fun today. You got to enjoy it because, you know, we're going to die soon. So you got to take advantage and do it now while you can. Right? That's the way people think. Worldly people think that way. In other words, eat, drink, for tomorrow you die. That's a carnal, worldly way of thinking. Jacob wasn't like that. Jacob saw the value in the birthright, and he said, I want that. So if you want a bowl of soup, he said, I'll trade it. I'll trade it for your birthright. You give me the birthright, and I'll give you a bowl of soup. And he says, well, he says, what good is this birthright to me if I'm just going to die anyway? So he had no, no vision of what the Lord had done for him. All that he could see is, I'm going to die soon, right? So what did he do? So he despised, the Bible says, he despised his birthright, sold it to his brother Jacob, and then he took and he ate. And it said that he ate and he, he was not, right, he was feeling good, right, which is actually where, where Ecclesiastes get it, gets it from. He said, he said, all that there is in this world is eat and drink for tomorrow you die. That is the way of the world, obviously. That's not the way we live. It's not what we believe, right? It's not what the Lord has done for us, right? He's given us eternal life. But for someone that doesn't have that, right, Esau, Esau was given, right, L listen to that for a second, Esau was given, the right of the firstborn, which is, which is a symbol of Jesus Christ, right? The firstborn among many brethren. He was given the right, right? And what did he do? The right or the righteousness, the access, right? And what did he do? He heard that and he despised it, right? Actually, in Hebrews, and I'll read it to you very quickly. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 16, it said that we shouldn't be that way, right? That we, lest, lest there be any fornicator or profane, which is wicked person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, right? That's what Esau was like. So the Lord tells us, don't be like Esau, don't be like Edom. In other words, Edom or Esau is a picture of people that turn their heart away from the gospel, right? In other words, they hear it and they despise it. They hear it and they turn their mind away. So the question is, who is this who comes, right? If you can picture it in your mind, who is this who comes with, with garments that are stained? Like it, it, they're stained with, they're stained with, um, they're, sta they're dyed, it says. It, it says, who is he who comes? And the answer, listen, in other words, what, what he's saying is, who is he who comes in judgment? Because what he talks about is, in what we just read in Isaiah 63 is that th that that stain on his garment is actually the blood 
right, of judgment that comes from, the, from the, day, the day of vengeance that the Lord talks about. In other words, the punishment that comes upon those that don't, do not believe, those that turn or despise the gospel, right? But listen to what he says so you can picture God appropriately in your heart, right? He, this is a warning. This is Isaiah saying, don't turn your heart away. Don't be like Edom, right? Don't, don't turn your heart away from what Christ has done. So, so when, when the prophet is told, he is told by God to tell the people, who is he who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Basra is the same way as saying Edom. Basra actually literally uh, physically is in Edom, right? Basra in Edom. So he's saying the same thing. Who is he who comes from Edom with dyed garments? Like, like in other words, someone that has just come from war, right? Or in this case, judgment. It says, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And the answer is, I who speak. So this is Christ saying, that's me coming. He says, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. In other words, the one that's warning you, and, and this is something good for you to hear, right? The one that warns the world about judgment to those who do not receive the gospel, he says, I am the one that has saved, right? In other words, I'm, I don't want you to know me as the harsh judge, I want you to know me as Jesus, and Jesus means what? God, our salvation, right? Mighty to save. Jesus, God, our salvation is what Jesus means, right? So what, he, what he's saying is, I want to be known. The one that you see coming, and even though you might, you might see my garment stained, right, with the blood of those that refuse to believe, he's saying what I want you to know me as is I want you to know me as Savior, I want you to know me as the one that has been trampled upon. I said the one that has taken judgment upon himself, the one that there was no one around, the one that was left by himself to hang on a cross, having everyone abandoned him, right, was left alone by himself to be judged for your sins. In other words, the, 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 the harshness of the judgment that you hear, right, that would come upon you is the harshness of the judgment that has come upon me right? You understand? In other words, all the judgment that you hear talk about uh, for those that will not believe, it says that they, it will burn, it will be an eternal fire, right? The, the, the severity of that judgment is the severity of the judgment that came upon Jesus Christ. It, 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 in other words, he will say he, he was the one that was trampled upon like in a wine press. It was his blood that flowed, right, for the sins of the people. So what wickedness it is, right, to hear a gospel so beautiful and to turn your heart away from that. Now, most of the time, I will say this, you know, as opinion, I think most of the time people don't turn their hearts away from the gospel because of how good it sounds. I think a lot of times people turn their heart away from the gospel because it is portrayed incorrectly. In other words, people sometimes are wanting to be uh, frightened into the kingdom. Like, if you don't receive Jesus today, you can get hit by a bus tomorrow and you will die in your sins, right? But, but the, the, the picture that God wants to give about who is he who comes in judgment, the Lord says, my judgment is righteous, right? In other words, I have done everything for you. And the, the only judgment that people will ever come into, right, is being judged for refusing to believe what I have given, never to be judged for their sins, right? That, that no one in the world will ever be judged for any action that have, they have ever committed. When the Lord says, when the Lord says, I believe in John, he says that, um, and I'll try to find that for you quickly here. In John um, 5, let's read that real quick. John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life already, past tense, right? Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and, and those who hear will live, right? Oh, that's always in conjunction, right? If you hear, you live. So obviously, you, you already know where we're going to, right? If you don't hear, right? If you hear, you live. If you hear, you don't come into judgment. So the, the judgment that people come into who don't hear is not actually the punishment for their sin, right? But it's the judgment of the devil. And there, there is a whole, you know, you can, you can look up vengeance. You can look up uh, judgment, 
uh, on Reform U, and you can get tons of stuff on our website that'll clarify that. We, won't, we don't have the opportunity to go into all of that, right? But it's obviously not a judgment for their sin. Jesus was judged for the sins of the people. So obviously, when people reject the gospel, they're not being judged for their sin, right? They're being judged for their refusal to accept what God has so freely provided, right? He wants to be known as the one who has saved, mighty to save, right? Strong, right? He has saved. The strong one has saved. Um, in verse number um, 26, he says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment. He says, also, because he is the Son, uh, also, it says, because he is the Son of God. He says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good, what do we say that is? Believing, hearing, right? Those who have done good. What is the good? Hearing. He just said above in verse 24, the one that hears and believes he is the one that has life and won't come into judgment. That's the good. Those who have done good to, to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil or wicked as Esau, Edom, right? That is the picture of those uh, of judgment, right? To the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. I hear as I hear I judge. And my judgment, he says, is righteous. My judgment is righteous. Now, now wh why is it that the judgment of God is said to be righteous, right? Like, that, that's, that's something good to kind of major on, right? And we'll talk about that. Why is, why is judgment or the judgment of Christ said to be righteous? Um, let, let me read this to you. Genesis 25. Genesis 25. So you, just so you can see what we were just talking about before, but that you could see Esau and you could see Jacob, and you can see why is God right to say about Esau that even after he ate and he despised his birthright, then he wants the favor of his father, right? In other words, uh, the way the physical story goes, Esau uh, sells his birthright to Jacob, and then Jacob is being sneaky, right, with his dad, and he actually goes to his father to receive the blessing of the firstborn, right? to receive the blessing of him who was born first, right? But, yet, but he's pretending to be Esau, and he puts on like animal hair or fur to appear to be hairy, and, and, and even his dad says, you sound like Jacob, but you feel and you smell like Esau, right? So he's being deceptive in what he's doing, but the point is not his actions, right? The, 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 because people see that and they, yeah, how could he get away, from, away with that when he was doing wrong? But, but the point is not his actions. The point is, what did Jacob do right? Jacob uh, appreciated, Jacob valued is a better word. Jacob valued the birthright. And he, he valued it so much that he was willing to, to tell Esau, I'll purchase that from you so that I can have that birthright myself. Now, obviously, spiritually speaking, God had even said, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Why? Because Jacob was the one that put faith in God. In other words, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The, he is one of our fathers of the faith. So what, the only thing Jacob did right is what we have done right. He has heard and he listened, therefore he has entered into life, therefore he has entered into no judgment, right? So, so, so what he physically did about being deceptive with his dad, right, to pretend to be Esau so that he would receive the blessing, Spiritually speaking, he did receive the blessing, right? And Esau did not. Why? Because Esau despised Christ where Jacob has not despised Christ, right? So, so because Jacob valued Jesus, right, he has received the blessing just like physically speaking, right? He valued the birthright and he received the blessing. And, and, and then when Esau wanted that blessing, he said, you know what? The dad said to, um, the dad said to him, he said, he said I, can't, I can't bless you. He said, I have already blessed your brother. Basically, what's done is done. I've already blessed your brother. Therefore, he said, there's nothing that I can give you. And, 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 and that is very similar, right, where the Lord talks, you know, that there'll, there'll come a day when people will come, right, and they'll be knocking on the door wanting to get in. But you know what? It was too late. I was preaching to you for years. I stood up on a tower, and I had all of my church ministering the good news to you so that you would hear, and you despised it, and you turned your face away. Now, when you, when you are in fear, and now, now that you want to come, now it's too late. 
right? But right now, this minute that we were hearing this, right, this time that we're in right now, it's not too late, right? The Lord is heralding the gospel so that people will hear. The Lord is preparing people like you so that you can tell other people, right? Tell other people what? Tell other people the, 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 how marvelous it is, the work that he's done, how, how beautiful it is for, for Christ to have said, in this is the judgment of the world. When he was going to the cross, right before going to the cross, he says, in this is the judgment of the world. And he went and was crucified, right? And had all of the punishment of the sins of the world come upon himself. And he did that by himself, right? Because there was a time there was a time when the Lord looked upon the earth and he said, you know what? He said, he said, I see that there is no intercessor. He said, there is no justice. Everyone does wrong. He says, but there is no intercessor. Therefore, I will bring an intercessor, right? Now we have, there is an intercessor in the world, right? There is one who intercedes for us before the Father so that when you hear people, and listen, a common carnal misunderstanding with people is, I'm going to hell, but I deserve it because I've been bad. Listen, you hear that in movies. You hear that in people's comments toward you. People believe that it is okay that, you know what, they're not sure about heaven or hell, but they say, you know what, if there is a hell and I'll go to it, that's okay because I know what I've done. Therefore, like, I deserve to go. But what they don't understand is they don't see the price that Christ paid for that sin that they've committed. That the the supposed quote-unquote foolish guilt that they feel for what they've done is guilt that is misplaced, right? Guilt that is misplaced because Christ has already become guilty for them, right? Christ has already taken the the, the sin that they feel guilty over, Christ already bore that guilt. So, so, like, you don't see the foolishness of what you say when when you're saying, you know what, yeah, if I I go to hell, that's okay, but you're going to go with me, right? But you, you hear that all the time. That is a common that, that's a common understanding within the world of people that aren't really too sure, but say, you know what, it's okay because I know how bad I've been. People that feel that they are beyond redemption because they've done this to their kids or they've done that to their husband or they've killed a person or they've done X, Y, or Z, not really knowing that there is no sin that is red enough, right, that is redder, right, than the, than, than, than the redness of the blood of Christ. In other words, what I mean by that is there is nothing that is more, that, that you could do that is more severe than the severe price that Christ paid, right? So it has already been finished. It has already been done. People need to know that, and the church needs to be schooled in the gospel so it can just say that. Just say that. Just say what Christ has done so that the world can hear it, right? But if we get up on our tower that we've been given, if we get up on our podium that we've been given, and all we know how to talk about is the sin of the world, or all we know how to talk about is trying to be inspirational to people the way, you know, all these other inspirational speakers are that make no difference in the world whatsoever apart from giving people temporal help, right? The Lord has not raised up the church and given us a platform to offer people temporal help. The Lord has raised us up on a platform in order to give people eternal life. That's a huge difference, right? A huge difference. It's not about eternal, it's not about temporary help. It's about eternal life. Because you could say, well, what's wrong with inspirational speakers? Doesn't that help people temporarily? Doesn't it lift up the spirits of people? Yeah, it does. It does. But it, it is useless, right? Because it's only temporal. It just feeds into the idea that eat and drink for tomorrow you die. In other words, live happy. It's like like pumping someone that is in pain full of morphine. They're still dying. They just don't feel it, right? So the desire of God is to give people eternal life, to take them out of death. So it's not that they don't, they don't, you don't have to numb yourself to the death that you're going to die, right? You, you can be given actual clarity, right? Clarity to be able to see, no, I don't have to die. No, I have been given life. No, I will live forever, right? That's a huge, huge difference, right? That's what the church ought to be saying, right? That's what the church ought to be saying. Um, so, so let me read to you Genesis 25, 29 quickly. Genesis 25, 29 So you can see good and wickedness, right? It says, now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called what? Edom, right? When when the Lord was asked, 
looking at him, said, who is he who comes from Edom and from Basra, right? right? He was, he's, he's coming having warned the people, right, that you will die in your sins if you don't receive the, the gospel of, that, that I'm speaking to you, right? It's speaking about Esau, right? Spe- that it's just an example of people that turn their heart away from the Lord. Verse number 31 said, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as it is this day. You know, someone that values the gospel, right? Someone that values righteousness. Somebody that is not trying to achieve their own righteousness, right? Uh, But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as it is this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. What's the mentality there? Eat, drink for tomorrow you die. He said, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Right? He despised it. He didn't see, he didn't see what the Lord trying to teach him, just like he was teaching Jacob, just like he was teaching Abraham, just like he was teaching Isaac. He was teaching Esau the same thing. Esau did not turn away in ignorance. Esau turned away knowing, having received and despised it. Right? Right? That is an educated decision. Right? Verse number 33, then Jacob said, swear to me as it is this day. So he swore to him, sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Right? Eat, drink, for tomorrow you die. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Right? Thus Esau, it says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Right? That's what he says in Hebrews 12. Let's not, let us not be and have the mind of that man. Right? That said, eat and drink for tomorrow you die and despise and forget and be forgetful of the things, right, that the Lord has said, right? But that we would be, right, and obviously we, we've done that, right? We have heard and then we have continued to hear, right? That, that is the not growing weary and well, well-doing that we've done, right? That, that's, that's, uh, that's what the Lord's talking about there. Um, if we can go real quick to Isaiah 59, verse number 15. It says, so truth fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Um, then the Lord saw it and, it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. So the Lord was looking upon the earth, right? And he said that the Lord was displeased because there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man. Again, remember, you're reading Isaiah. You're reading a man who's prophesying to the people, telling them what God sees and what God wants them to hear, right? He says, he, verse 16 said, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no, that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm bought salvation for him and his own righteous, it sustained him, right? So what he's saying there is, right, he, he saw, the, the Lord obviously knew the condition of the earth, right? He, he knew that there was no one that could do good. He knew that there was no one that could justify themselves. He, actually, that's one of the things that is said about Edom or about those that turn away from the Lord. It said they looked, it said to justify themselves. They looked to make themselves righteous. He said, he said, he said people like that, those are the ones that don't accept the gospel. People that think that they can justify their own selves, right? But he, instead, he said, the Lord said an intercessor is needed. Someone that would come and bear the punishment and the shame for their sins. Someone that would come and pay the penalty that is due them. Someone that would come and actually take upon himself the judgment that I'm speaking to people that it is, in other words, it's foolishness for people to suffer a judgment that is not even their judgment, a judgment that is of the devil, right, that is intended for him, right, because the devil of this world has already been judged. So why would you want to suffer the judgment of the devil when you could receive the salvation that Christ has so freely provided, right? So, so, so it's foolishness, right? It's nonsensical for people to, to suffer with the devil when they've been given a way of escape already, right? Already given a way of escape. Um. In, in John 16 and verse number 8, John 16 and verse number 8, and when he has come, he, speaking about the Spirit of God coming to the earth the way he is today, right? he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me. Of sin because they don't believe in me. The church needs to understand that, right? The, 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 the condemnation that people can receive in the last day is just because they don't believe in him. Just because the Lord has suffered for us and we've turned our hearts away. Obviously, we haven't, right? But people, there are people that have turned their heart away. But there are so many, listen, there are multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes of people that if they were just to hear the gospel, if they were to hear the good news about what Christ has done, their minds would change from feeling, you know what, I'm so bad anyway. If there is a hell, I'll go and I'll suffer the hell. Who, I mean, I understand that. Kind of like it makes sense. They'll see how foolish that is when you tell them there's someone that has already suffered the shame and the punishment for what you've done. For that thing that you feel so guilty about, that you've been carrying the guilt of this for years. You work with people today. 
You work with people and you associate with people every day, right? Maybe not every single day, but you associate with people regularly that think like that, that live with the guilt always in their mind and think that it is a righteous thing that they would suffer because God is just, right? He's the judge of all the world, but God has already judged, right? The judge of all the world has already judged, and he is the one that has said, right? I, w- when you want to know who is he who comes and speaks about judgment, it is the Savior that is speaking to you about judgment. In other words, look at the message from where it's coming from, right? The message of judgment for those that don't believe is coming from him, right, who is the one that saves. So the primary message is Look at what I have done. Look at how I have saved. Look at everything that I have done for you. And in, in, in respect to that, let me read this to you. Isaiah chapter 5. Let's jump over there while well, we have a little bit of time, right? Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 1. And, and you'll like this. Listen carefully to this. It says, now let, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard, right? The vineyard of the Lord. It says, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Right? My beloved, it says, has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Right? The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, right, it says that we are the Lord's field. Right? In other words, the Lord has put everything um, upon this earth in order for us to be able to look up and clearly see a serpent on a pole and be saved. Right? The Lord wants the serpent on the pole to be evident to all. Right? So that if all can, their eyes could be drawn to the serpent on the pole, then they can be saved. Right? So, so he says he, he's, uh, th- he has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, cleared out its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine, right? So the Lord has done everything. He has prepared, right, a vineyard. He says that he planted it with the choicest vines. What is he looking for if the Lord has planted seed of the choicest vine, right? He's taken from, from the vine that has been the most prosperous, right? He has planted from that vine on the earth. What is he looking for? Fruitfulness, right? He, he wants that fruitfulness for us, and he wants the fruitfulness to come right from him. So it says, he dug it up, he cleared out the stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower. The word for tower there is called rostrum. A rostrum is a raised platform on which a person stands to make a public speech, right? In other words, the Lord has set up within his vineyard a tower, and upon that tower, he has set the church there. So the church can be the mouthpiece of the Lord to speak the good news and to make those of his, to make his vineyard fruitful the lord wants a fruitful vineyard right and he's given us a way to be fruitful and all that he's saying is listen to he who speaks right that if i i am the one that's speaking i know that you've heard about judgment but the one that's talking to you about judgment that is to come right right keep your mind not on judgment but keep your mind on this news keep your mind on the good news he says he says um it, he, he set a tower, it says, in the midst, and also made a wine press in it. So he expected, listen to what his expectation was about this vineyard. It says that he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but instead it says it brought forth wild grapes, which stands for poisoned grapes or poisoned berries, right? Instead of the, the vineyard being fruitful, instead it produced poison, right? Poisoned berries. He says, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, right? Judge, li- listen, listen to what he says. Judge, please, between me and my vineyard. In other words, look to see if I am not being righteous in what I've done. Look to see if I am not right in the way that I'm judging. He says, he says judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? What more could God do for the earth that he has not already done, right? So is God harsh Right? When, when people die in their sins, it, is, it, is that God being unfeeling? Is, it, is, is God being unfeeling when he says Jesus Christ is the only way? Right? Is he being unfeeling? He, he took the sin of the Buddhist and put it upon his son. Is he unjust? Right? Is he unjust to say that Buddhism is not the way to the Father? Right? Is he unjust to only make one way? The way that he made was the way of one that was the only one in all of the existence of the earth that has suffered the penalty of the sin of all that have ever lived. No one has ever done or will ever have to do that ever again, right? 
So is he unjust? He says, judge between me and my vineyard. He said, when people suffer, are they suffering because I've done nothing? When people are in pain, are they in pain because I've done nothing? When people die depressed, when they commit suicide, have they done so because I've done nothing? Have I been slow? Have I not done anything for this earth? Is that why people are suffering today? Is there hunger in the earth today because I've done nothing and been still in heaven and I've been slowful to speak or to do anything or to act? No, right? He is known as he who is mighty to save. He has saved. He's not going to save. He has already saved, right? He says, you, you that are hearing this, he's saying, judge between me and my vineyard. Have I not done, listen to that again, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it. He said, even though they, I gave them every opportunity to be fruitful and they produce poison out of their lives, right? Is that my fault? Am I the one that has done wrong, right? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now it says, please, let me tell you what, will, what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and I shall not, it shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I also command the clouds. I will also command the clouds that no, no rain, that they rain no rain on it. Verse number seven, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the pleasant plant. Look, he looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Look, look at the, the same, very, very similar, very, very similar view in Matthew 21. If you heard that, that was out of Isaiah 5, which sounds very, very much like Matthew 21. L- listen to Jesus giving a very similar parable. It says in verse number 33, Matthew 21, 33, It says, hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge around it, right? I believe that's uh, to protect it, to keep it, I believe. He said he dug a wine press in it and built a tower, right? Same thing that you saw in Isaiah. He, 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 He put a hedge about it. He built a vineyard. He put a tower in the middle of it. Why? So that people could hear, so that no one could say, you know what? I did it, but I did it in ignorance. The Lord wants the gospel to go around the entirety of the world, right, for all men to know. Verse number, uh, he said, and he, and he leased it, the latter part of verse number 33, he leased it to the vine dressers and he went into a far country. It, so obviously that's what the Lord has done, right? He came, he suffered for the church, he has given and set up the church, right, as an, as an organization within the earth and given it a platform in order to herald the gospel to everyone that lives, right, so that all will hear. Uh, and then, and then, right? He he went up and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has and he lives on the inside of us as well to be able to speak through us, right? While we're here, he says, and the vine dressers. Sorry, sorry. Verse thirty-four. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. So, what is God wanting, right? The same thing as he said in Isaiah. The Lord was wanting that vineyard to be fruitful. He gave it every opportunity and wanted it to be fruitful, right? And, and at the time that he came, listen, at the time that he came, so you can, this is kind of like a translation of that, right? In, in a sense. But if people obviously don't know the Lord, they would have read, heard the parable and not understood that either, right? Um, it's evident to us. But, um, he said, when, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that he might receive its fruit. Verse 35, and the vine dressers took his servants, listen, took his servants. These are the prophets that have been sold, sent. This is Isaiah. This is Micah. This is Jeremiah. This is Ezekiel. This, these are all these people that have been sent constantly to the earth to be able to do the same thing, to get up on that, t- on that tower and to proclaim the gospel. Churches that have been stood up to proclaim the gospel. It says, you beat one. You killed one, you stoned another. He says, again, he sent other servants. You see the persistence of God? I send you somebody, you kill him. I'll send you another, you kill him, you stone him. I'll send you another, I'll send you another. That, if that is not the loving kindness of God, I don't know what it is. The patience of the Lord willing that none should perish over and over. You kill his servants, he sends you more, right? You kill his servants, he sends you more, right? He's leaving, that, that tower is set up, that rostrum that's being set up until Jesus comes back. The church will always have that platform and we, sh- we should use it appropriately, right? Every church should use it appropriately. Every church should use it appropriately. Um, he said in verse number 33, again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they likewise, they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. 
But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance, right? The, the, the one that they want to kill to seize his inheritance, right? The one that was crucified is the one that was being crucified in order to give you his inheritance, right? Right? Foolishness. That's what that's called. Foolishness. Verse number 39. So they took him and they cast him uh, out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes... What will he do to the vine dressers? The question there is the same as before. What else could I have done? Judge between me and the vine dressers. Just between me, the Lord says, right, and my vineyard. What else could I have done for them that I didn't already do for them? Right? It, you that have any wisdom whatsoever, right, what else could I have done if not die for the penalty of their own sin? Right? He said, so, so, uh, so, so when he comes, again, verse number 40, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what, what will he do to the vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably. What is wickedness? Turning your face away from what Christ has freely done for you, right? That's the wickedness of men only, and that's the only wickedness. He says, and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers. The reference there is he would take the gospel from the people of Israel that depreciated it, and he will give it to the Gentiles, right? If you didn't want the gospel, I'll give it to the rest of the world. They'll appreciate it. They'll value what I've done, right? And we believe also that there's still a time remaining, where, where, there, there's still a time coming where many, many that are actually born Jews will still continue to turn their hearts to the Lord, right? Nothing special about the Jewish nation. Today, we're all the same. We have all been given the gospel, Jew or Gentile, and right now he has made of both one, right? Just, just believers, right? Uh, in, in, if we jump down to verse number uh, well, look at, look at 41 again. He says, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit. It says the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, have you, have you never read, it says in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes, right? In other words, the one that you hear in, in the Bible that talks about, you know, the judgment and warning them time after time, warning them about, about this that would happen. He wants them to hear. He was preaching the gospel to them in order so that they would hear and so, so, that, so that they wouldn't be hurt, so that they would be protected. So that, I mean, every single opportunity was given and is still given to people, right, today. They hear the gospel over and over. I don't even know how many times I rejected the gospel. My wife, who at the time was just my girlfriend, how many times she spoke to me and I rejected what she said, right? I told her she was a fool for believing what she believed, right? N not knowing that I was actually the fool, right? But I was calling her a fool. Yet I, all along, I was the fool, right? I, I was the one with fool written upon my head, right? Um, in, in, just to wrap up here, in two verses I want to read to you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 9. Right? It says that God did not appoint us to wrath, but he appointed us to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, right, who has died for us. For, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, right? So the cool thing there is that God has appointed to all men, all men, whoever, doesn't matter who they are, whether they are dead or alive right now, he has appointed to all men, right, to live. He's appointed all men to salvation, that that's God appointment to men. He said, I have appointed all men. So every man, right, every, every person alive or dead, right, has been given an appointment with life, has been in, given an appointment to live to salvation. People turn that down, right? You could look at God and you say, you know what, Lord, you have done everything for them. The fact that they rejected something, that's between them and you, right? That's, that's just up to them. They're the ones that turn their eyes from you, right? First John 4, verse number 17, and I'll stop right here. 1 John 4 and verse number 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Isn't that a cool thing? That we can have boldness, he says, in the day of judgment. Why is that? Because he says, because as he is, so are we in the world even right now, right? Are we like that? That we can have boldness in that day, that we can come to God so confidently, right? That we see Jesus, you know what, and we don't, we don't, we don't need to cower at, at the idea of coming before a judge, right? But you know how confidently you can come before a judge when you know that he's the one that called you on the phone and told you, you are innocent and blameless in my sight without a single fault, right? You wouldn't hesitate to come before him, right? Because you know that he is savior, right? 
He's not, you're not coming to one that you're fearing his impending judgment and wrath upon you, but he is one who has already saved. The world needs to change. The world, not just Christians, but the world needs to change its view from God, the harsh judge, to God who saves. God, our salvation. His name is Jesus, right? God, our salvation, right? Isn't it a beautiful thing that that's what that means, that God named, the name that God chose to give his only begotten son that he sent into the world was God our salvation, Jesus, right? We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reformed Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.